Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the COVID-19 webinar series hosted by PASA Sustainable Agriculture. This is Hannah Smith Brubaker, the Executive Director, and we're very happy that you could join us today. Please keep in mind that all of our webinars are recorded and available afterward. You can find many of PASA's resources at pasafarming.org slash resources. Um, you can also stay up to date with COVID-19 specific resources, including these webinars uh, at pasafarming.org slash COVID-19. Today, we're very happy to have um, some guests with us to talk about the um, aggregation and distribution end of things. Uh, I'll be your host today, Jacqueline Smith, who happens to also be a PASA staff member, but who runs Central Grazing Company, is going to be uh, one of our guests today, as well as Neil Stauffer from Harvey Farms Pittsburgh and Sabina Carey from Center Markets. Uh, you may have heard if you logged in early that everyone on the call will stay muted. If you do have a question at any point during the webinar, please enter that question into the Q&A and we'll be uh, doing our best to get to those questions today. If the webinar ends and we do not have, um, have not had a chance to answer your question, we'll try to include that in our follow-up after the webinar. Today, Jacqueline is going to be addressing uh, the overview of distribution methods. Neil will be looking at CSA aggregation and Sabina will be talking about farm market aggregators. Uh, and then we'll try to finish up with uh, first questions that were submitted ahead of the webinar and then any questions uh, asked during the webinar. Christina, do we have a poll today? Yeah, we absolutely do. Would you like me to go ahead and start that? Sure. All right. So today we have a, um, a poll. It's an anon anonymous poll if you get a chance to answer the questions during the webinar about uh, pre-order, prepay, and pre-pack. Um, and uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll have our, our results for that. You'll know that you have successfully completed the poll because your poll window will disappear from your view. Go ahead, Christina. Uh, so before we get started, just remember every week we emphasize this wherever possible, focus on pre-order, prepay, prepack, and then deliver or grab and go. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with Jacqueline. Thank you, Hannah. This is Jacqueline. Um, I'm excited to share this knowledge that we've gained through Central Grazing Company to help fast track some knowledge. Um, and it's like critical time when farmers are kind of figuring out what resources they have and how to get products out to consumers in this new world. So I wanted to just share just a briefly about what Central Grazing Company does. We're actually located in Lawrence, Kansas, and our main revenue streams are grocery retail. We sell um, lamb that we aggregate. We grow it ourselves, and we also aggregate from farmers in four different states, which are Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. And um, the lamb that we sell off of our website, we have a consumer-facing website, which we designed in order to kind of help raise some of our margins um, that are lowered by going into the retail, grocery retail um, market. And in order to kind of help elevate our margins, we, and to help with some of the different cuts that are available um, that maybe the, rest, the restaurants or the grocery stores don't need, we designed a consumer subscription box where they sign up and they have a monthly subscription and we get to fill whatever items that we have in overstock or whatever is in season into the package and then we ship it out. We ship through all of the United States except for Alaska and Hawaii. And because we're centrally located in Kansas, we're able to get to either coasts um, in four shipping days by ground, which really helps us to kind of lower the overhead and the cost, the shipping costs. So it's kind of in our favor that we're able to do that. And we had to piece together quite a lot of things in order to get this subscription program running. And I wanted just to kind of 
share that knowledge with you so other people who might be considering shipping nationally can like learn from what we learned and kind of fast track that to it because there's a lot of testing that has to go on to make sure that um, qualities of, of shipping containers and all that kind of stuff um, hold up in shipment. So Christina, if you want to move to the next slide. All right, so through, this is just from our own experience and we've gone through We've looked at and gone through and worked with different types of distribution. And of course, the first one that most people would be knowledgeable about are going through distributors um, in the natural food market where they set up accounts, you ship them to their central warehouses that are distribution points throughout the United States. And then they um, set, have the direct relationships to the grocery store and send it directly to the grocery stores. Um, how that works. That's a very complicated model and it's very expensive for small producers like us. And so we, when we were looking at our um, business model, we definitely decided not to go into that kind of distribution model. So we already knew that we were going to have to design a warehouse and store our stuff that we drop ship from our dock. So in kind of the step between doing going through a distributor and then going right to your own distribution facility, there's this um, three PLs or third party logistics that exist throughout the United States. And they're typically mostly in the Midwest around Kansas City area, because again, this is the best place to kind of ship from. But um, one of the most well-known distribution centers is called eGourmet. And eGourmet is, um, offers all of the services that you need. They have boxes that they pull from, they can do freezer cold storage. Um, they have an assembly line where you can put packs together with multiple different SKUs, and then they handle all the shipping and they bill you once a month. There's fees associated with that, of course, and some of the problems that we ran into using a third-party logistics is that you, you have limited control over the quality of their shipping. And so um, mispicks were really common. It, it became um, pretty expensive to have to pay for those mispicks because the third party logistics, they um, will only pay about 30% of the cost of the product. So you lose some money when they make mistakes. And um, they always ship in styrofoam, which was really kind of hard for me to wrap my head around about sending a bunch of styrofoam out when we're trying to work with in farming practices that are better for the earth. And so um, we look, took a hard look at that. Another, another issue we ran into is some third-party logistics, and all of them are different. But the, the cleanliness, cleanliness of the facilities, too, can kind of come into question. They have lots of big trucks that go in and out of those facilities, and there's like this fine dust that lays on all of your products. And so um, when you're really packaging, when you're taking a step back from having that direct consumer relationship with your customers, making sure that the product arrives and packaged in a really nice way is, is, is important to have retention with your customers. So after looking at the national model and then doing a third party logistics that we had hired for fulfillment, we decided that the best thing for our business was to, to design our own warehouse. So we have a small warehouse, it's only 1600 square feet, has a dock, and we have set up a system where we um, have a freezer where we pull all of our orders from that freezer and then we ship it directly through FedEx. So let's go to the next slide, Christina. Um, so some things that we learned very quickly is like, how do we get the, the materials that we need in order to kind of have this fulfillment center where we drop ship all of our our stuff and we've experimented with lots of different types of boxing materials and of course all of them have different uh, levels of function when they're being shipped and, and when you're shipping across the nation or even just um, shipping on ground you have to make sure that, that that box can hold up in a four or five day shipping time um, again most of the time you can get to the coast in four days but Sometimes there's little delays in FedEx and you gotta make sure that that box can sit over the weekend if necessary with enough dry ice in it. We ship frozen, but people who have perishable items can also ship this way too. Um, so look at materials, the, the boxes that go into it. You're gonna have to you know, make sure that you've got a good supply for um, shipping tape and cardboard boxes, either recyclable or um, new boxes. And um, if you're doing perishable items, you need to get a supply of 
dry ice packs or gel packs and then make sure that you've got some dry ice shipment. And then um, one of the company that we have experimented the most with for boxes is green cell foam. And I think that they're located in Iowa, but they make this non um, GMO biodegradable foam insulation that um, can, that comes with a film that can be recycled and the box can be recycled. And then the, the green cell foam insulation is actually, you can like compost it or you can put it outside and it, and it just washes away with the rain or you can just wash it down your sink too. So it's really kind of a good product to um, in place of styrofoam. But we've done some testing on these kinds of boxes and the green cell from our test, our personal testing can hold up just as well as styrofoam can. And styrofoam is like the best way to ship product across the nation as far as holding up in shipment. But green cell performs just as well as styrofoam and we've been very happy with the, with what, how they perform for us. And then dry ice too. You can find some regional dry ice suppliers um, it usually comes in totes. It can be a, a 10 pound bag down to a five pound bags and pellets. And when you're looking at dry ice and you want to take into consideration that dry ice sublimates during shipment. So the more that it is exposed to oxygen and air, the less dry ice you're going to have in that shipment. And so we've, we've experimented and found that um, a block of five, uh, five pounds of dry ice per 24 hours of shipment. And when you go onto FedEx or UPS, websites you can see their zone maps where you can figure out how far that shipment or how many days that shipment on a good shipping day is going to take to get to California or to Oregon or to New York or wherever you're shipping and um, then you can pack as much dry ice as you need to get into that, that box to hold up in that shipment. If you're shipping perishable items that do not need to be frozen some uh, people will put the dry ice on the bottom of the bat or the bottom of the box, and then they'll put the gel packs on top of the dry ice. So the dry ice is actually holding the gel packs or keeping the gel packs frozen versus freezing. You know, if you're shipping vegetables or flowers or whatever, it kind of helps keep um, the the temperature from getting too warm dry, or, and uh, melting those dry ice packs, those gel packs. So those are the kinds of uh, things that you need to take into consideration when you're doing perishable or frozen shipment. Um, some of these things that you can find, like, again, I mentioned Green Cell, which is the company that we have the best experience with. Now, um, most of the, those earth-friendly custom-made boxes, shipping containers um, will require, they're, they're a little bit more expensive than styrofoam. They will require an initial investment to, in order to get the price down to be competitive with with styrofoam, but um, if you can manage to do that, that's a, a really great source. Another place that you can look is Uline, which is, um, you can buy one or two boxes or maybe 20 boxes from them or whatever, but their prices are not very competitive. And, and if you are looking for a better way to ship styrofoam, a company called Atlas Molding Products has a recycle program that you can set up that they actually take the boxes back after shipment so that it doesn't end up in landfill. But they, you can actually buy really inexpensive boxes through Atlas and buy small quantities of like maybe 50 at a time, whatever you need. So there's a couple different um, shipping options that you have. We also have an Amazon store, so we sell through Amazon. Amazon has a shipping component to it where you can buy shipping through Amazon. I have not explored this in too much detail, but I just wanted to like mention to you guys that there is this option to kind of buy some shipping through FedEx. Um, UPS, obviously, or FedEx are the two sources that we use. It's ground. Um, if you can get the United States Post Office, if you could do it within a certain size box, it, it can be competitive with UPS or FedEx, but it's the ground shipment that you need. You can go directly to UPS or FedEx and get um, an account set up. And if you do a business account, you can save about 13% off of retail for both of those companies. But I would really highly recommend for you guys to go through a third party um, for, or logistics um, shipping option. And one of them is called PeriShip. There's a couple others that exist, but I have used PeriShip for 15 years and really they're a small company out of Connecticut and they do a really great job with um, tracking your packages and making sure that they're arriving on time and contacting you if you need any help or assistance and 
in um, delayed packages. So it really helps tighten up the customer support from your end. And when you go through Parachip, depending on how many shipments you have, because it's all based on volume, you can start saving about 30% off of retail through UPS and FedEx. And you basically just get a, an account number from Parachip that's connected to a FedEx account. And then Parachip bills you once a month for that service. Okay, Christina. All right, good. That's one of my things I have All right, thank, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, again, if you have questions for Jacqueline, just type them into the Q&A and we'll either answer them directly to you um, in writing or bring them up as questions at the end of the webinar. And next we're moving on to Neil Stauffer and he'll be talking about Harvey Farms. Thank you, Hannah and Christina. I'm happy to be here and to share with everybody a little bit about our experience at Harvey and Harvey Farms Pittsburgh. Uh, I guess I will start by talking about, I, I'm here as a CSA aggregator, and so I guess I'll start with kind of our, my experience with CSA. I've been running a CSA in one form or another since 2006, um, sometimes as an individual farmer, sometimes as a multi-farm um, CSA aggregator, and I've used different platforms along the way to manage that. I uh, started out using um, Member Assembler, which is a product from Small Farm Central, and um, started that, like I said, in 2006, in that sweet spot, at least in this region of the country, where it seemed like every year you could uh, almost double your, your membership without having to put much effort into it. And uh, the trend was upward, and, and um, it, was, it was an exciting time for, for that CSA relationship. Then eventually it kind of leveled out in my experience, and it became a little more difficult, and uh, retention rates of CSA members were starting to dip and you know, um, started to wonder what the future of CSA might look like. Um, Simon Huntley, who, who developed that member assembler software also then did a lot of deep dive research into getting customer feedback on what was working for people and not working for people with the CSA model. And of course, every farm that does CSA has a different experience and there's a lot of variation. So I'm talking in generalizations here, but um, but the feedback was, you know, that, that uh, it the retention rates were lowering and part of the um, problem was, you know, from the customer experience that obviously getting a preset box of goods uh, only worked for some people. It was hard to, you know, have a one size fits all box. And so one of the major um, conclusions was that Simon wanted to develop a, a software, a technology solution to allow people to have more customization and control over what was going into their CSA box without making it difficult for the farmers uh, in the process. So that was what Harvey uh, software um, attempted to tackle. Uh, and I guess we'll call it the evolution of the CSA model. Not that the old models are dead or bad or, or nothing wrong with it. If it's working for your particular farm, fantastic. But uh, overall, there was a trend towards needing to see how um, people were getting their groceries, how people were getting their, their food procured. And, um, and so this Harvey was trying to allow customers to um, get what they want and less of what they didn't want. So long story short, this Harvey model um, allows every member who signs up to customize what's in their share by setting preferences and evaluating each crop that you as the farm is going to grow, whether they like it, hate it, or somewhere in between. And then and the software is able to uh, print out a, an order for each particular customer or member that uh, takes that into account. And there's some more detail to that that we get into later if, uh, if there's interest, but that's the general idea. There's also some more control over vacations and credits and um, just making it some of those touch points where uh, people might get tired of the frustrations of CSA and trying to smooth some of those out. So I ran that model, the Harvey Farm, the Harvey uh, software CSA model for the last three years. And then my wife and I moved off of that farm this past year and Simon approached me and said, hey, I think I've been watching these trends and I think we need to push this a little further. Um, people are getting more and more groceries online and having them delivered to their door. And I want to take away as many barriers as we can to help people get this great local food from farms uh, and just like basically not give people any excuse that, uh, that they can't access this great food. So we're running this um, pilot business called Harvey Farms Pittsburgh as a, as a test model to see how far we can kind of push this home delivery piece. 
Now it seems kind of like a no brainer sitting here in April, but of course we were having these conversations in December um, before COVID-19 and, and wondering if we could actually pull this off uh, and, and wondering if there was gonna be um, demand. Well, as many of you farmers know, the demand has not been the problem since, since uh, March and uh, it's mostly been trying to just keep up with uh, logistics and um, speeding up the launch. We weren't planning to launch until the end of May, but we have um, now done about six deliveries just this spring with this Harvey model of customizing boxes for everybody and then um, doing home delivery. So sometimes I think of it less as a CSA and almost as a local foods home delivery business um, but it's definitely coming from that CSA background. Um, let's see. I think the idea would be, and I, again, I was a farmer. I'm not a farmer now. This, this can be run either as a farm, as a way to manage your, your direct-to-consumer sales as a farm, or it could be uh, an entrepreneurial opportunity um, for someone who's not on a farm at the moment, but either wants an entry-level way to get into being a food hub or aggregating from multiple farms, which is what um, Harvey Farms Pittsburgh is now doing. So we're working with probably about 10 farms here in the first two months of our existence. And they range from grass-fed beef to produce. Uh, there's the honey guy, there's the maple guy, uh, and down the line. So I think we've got probably, um, uh, we had about 40 or 50 products on our, on our pick list uh, this past week. And so what we're really trying to transfer, transfer is, this idea of selling someone their, their veggies to selling someone their groceries. Uh, and what's been transformative in that is how much, and I've, I understand, we'll see what the new normal is like, that, that things are not exactly normal right now. But we've been impressed and surprised at how much um, people are willing to spend when they start thinking about getting their groceries from the local farms rather than just their vegetables. And so when we start adding in all these other products, um, the the average order size has almost tripled from what I'm used to in a traditional CSA model. The nice thing about that is that we can uh, start to delegate out some of the responsibilities of um, direct to consumer sales by uh, offloading some of the distribution onto other sources. Now in our situation, we don't own trucks. And so uh, it was easy for us to think about getting a third party to handle that. If you've got trucks and, and infrastructure on your farm, Perhaps there's ways that you can um, do that yourself too. But for us, we started looking into um, courier services, which is essentially just a localized version of a, of a shipping um, company. And it's been great. Uh, we found that our customers are willing to pay for that service. It's very common for them to pay for shipping, for getting things delivered to their door, and um, being able to pass that cost along has not been um, a stress for the business. And it's been a real opportunity for us to just delegate that responsibility to uh, or off of, off of our plate. And I think the farmer could do the same thing. Um, let's see, That's, that may be an urban resource. I'm not sure how widely uh, those services are available in rural areas, but I think that uh, there are more and more courier services available. Uh, I suppose though on the opposite side of that, what it, what it simplified for us in delivery logistics, it complicated a little bit in packaging logistics. So I was really glad to hear um, the uh, the Jack Jacqueline's notes about shipping and things. I've got um, some some uh, some opportunities there that I want to pursue as well. But we do need to incorporate how to keep things at temperature in a courier service because they're not going to be in refrigerated trucks. So there is there is some logistics to figure out there, but um, it's it's manageable. It's a better temperature control. Um, let's see. I think that kind of brings it to the end. I mean, I guess, again, I want to say just that I think the real, real takeaway is that uh, people are willing to spend more money than you might anticipate on a wide variety of locally sourced foods. And, and the relationship has become very strong between us and our customers already. Our courier came back just yesterday and said, I don't know how many friends you have out there, but it seemed like every house I stopped at, they were so glad to see me. I couldn't believe how excited they were that I showed up at their door. And so uh, that was just a neat feeling to realize that the courier recognized this isn't just a traditional delivery drop and go. This is, this is something that um, has a lot of meaning to people and um, feels like uh, a very powerful connection. And with that, I'll pass it back to uh, Hannah. Great, thank you, Neil. Thanks a lot. 
Um, so next we are going to be moving on to Sabina Carey uh, from Full Circle Farms and Center Markets. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, uh, my friends at PASA, for hosting this. Um, it's great to get an opportunity to just share some of the experiences that we've been having here in uh, central Pennsylvania. And um, so my background is um, I've been um, a longtime farmer. Um, I'm also a farmer's market um, vendor. I sell flowers and some other farm items. And I'm also on the managing board for one of our local farmer's markets. And Center Markets sort of came about, it took a couple of years, actually, we've, we've been working on it. And our original goal before COVID-19, we were working towards having Center Markets um, be a resource to local farmers markets and to um, provide collaborative marketing for all our Center County producer only farmers markets. So that's the direction we were heading, um, which gave us a really good um, networking within the local farmers markets and the vendors. And then when, um, when COVID-19 hit, it was really, um, it was really apparent that our local farmers markets were gonna need another way of, of moving. Um, product to our um, to our shoppers. So, what I what I wanted to do was to make it as easy as possible for our shoppers to to purchase from all our vendors, which they already know and love. Um, and when I went to our local farmers market, some of the vendors were like, "Oh, I don't I don't need an online store. People can pre order," but Amongst all the vendors, there was um, there was no two that were using the same system. So, you know, Farmer Poppy, like you could pre-order, but you had to call them, and you could order, but you couldn't pay. So you had to go to the farmers market and still deal, like with the whole cash transaction process. Um, then for another farmer, Farmer Mavis, like you had to text. Also, you couldn't prepay. Um, and then another whole um, farmer set up had their own website where you could pre-order, pre-pay, uh, but you couldn't pick it up at the farmer's market. You had to go to their farm on one day of the week, and it was like a two-hour window. So I, um, I knew that was going to be really, really frustrating for our shoppers to – to fill out like their weekly shopping. You know, I knew they wanted to support these farmers, but I also knew that it would take like a lot of effort on their part to, to make that happen. So um, I set up, I, I decided to go with the local line platform. I did a lot of comparison between them. And my original goal, hold on, next slide. My original goal was to have the, the farmer's market vendors have their own account so that they would be able to maintain their own inventory. Um, and then all the, the payments would go directly to them. And they would be able to determine at which farmer's market or uh, which day of the week their product would be available. So as it turns out, um, most, far, most, most of our producers were really more interested in having somebody else do that part. So I just set up a single um, vendor account and where I am collecting inventory from folks, collecting all the orders, letting them know what's ordered, collecting the payments, and then weekly or bi-weekly um, paying out the producers um, minus a 15% um, fee for administrative costs. Um, so I think that's, that's been well received. Some of our, our, our first market was, I'm trying to think, it was 
March 26th is when we took our first orders, and that was um, a grouping of Amish vendors, and they were really excited to be able to access this without any technical intervention on their part. They could just call me and say, hey, this is what I've got. I posted it. I let them know what was sold. I gave them the money. Everything was good. So we've just grown rapidly since then. So starting from March 26th, we had uh, our first week, we had nine orders. And now we're into week five, where we have, um, we had 36 orders on Tuesday. And we're adding more vendors. Um, I'm adding two or three more vendors this week. So the demand is there. I'm looking at my slides. Um, yeah, so the shoppers are loving uh, the service. They, um, they can order online uh, Sunday and Monday, and then they come to the farmer's market on Tuesday, and their bag is there. It's got their name on it. It's already paid for. All they have to do is look for their bag, grab it, and go. There's no contact needed on their part. Um, they are just so happy to come, and they are so grateful. And it's exactly what Neil was saying earlier. It's like we still have that connection with our shoppers from a distance, you know, like we exchange um, thank yous and it's, um, it's still wonderful to see them. So I think they are very, very grateful of having this opportunity to support their farmers like this. Um, a little bit more about the, the local line platform. So right now we are only operating on the individual tier. We're not, we haven't really gone to the next level where center markets is sort of the big umbrella with different vendors underneath it. We're still operating as a single entity, but I think as more larger vendors, um, are added as the season progresses with more inventory, I think they will be more likely to set up their own account so they can maintain their own, own inventory and also um, get paid directly without the intervening pass through of center markets. Um, a little bit of, of communication for our center markets. We are really lucky in that we already had an established website, um, which we set up thanks to our marketing grant. Um, we had already been promoting local markets. We already had a mailing list, which has just really grown um, incredibly over the last two weeks. We had um, our local newspaper came out on Tuesday and took pictures. We had the press come out and do interviews. So that was, um, that was really helpful to get the word out. And uh, we also have a really active local Facebook group that's just called Eat Local. And everybody is, um, is in there. They're sharing stories. They're telling each other how to get local food, who delivers, you know, are the markets safe? Like who's wearing masks? Who's wearing gloves? How are the lines? Those sorts of things. So it's a great way for us to spread our message that um, they can support their local vendors. So um, next steps. Um, we're working on just working on the liability and legal issues like setting up center markets as an LLC so we can keep better track of the, the money aspects and also the liability aspect. We're going to be working on um, local delivery starting in about two weeks. So we have a lot of ducks to get in our row. Um, I'm already hiring a bookkeeper to take care of the, um, just maintaining the, the finances between us and the, and the producers. And I already have a volunteer coordinator coordinator lines up because the aggregating is what takes a lot of time. Um, the, the vendors bring their products to us at the beginning of market and then we have a separate area 
actually inside a church set up where we aggregate and fill all the orders. And it takes a lot of time. And it's, um, we're learning a lot about checklists and checking those checklists several times because it's really easy to make a mistake. So we're working on installing a lot of systems and procedures. Um, but we're, um, we're going full steam ahead and the support is there. Um, another thing that we're also looking at is a way for um, our shoppers to be able to buy gift cards so that they can um, apply that to items brought in, bought in local line. And we're hoping that that way we can get community support to pay for produce to give to those that really need it that can't afford to buy to buy it. So we're hoping that this will also help a little bit of the food accessibility for those in our community that really are struggling. And I think that will make it um, an easy way of doing that. Um, and I think I think that's it. Great, I'll thank you so much, questions. Davina. Thank you. Um, we did have a someone in advance of the webinar today remind us that in lots of ways across the whole region, you know, farmers are pivoting, they're being their usual nimble selves. Um, farmers are collectively trying to figure out how to navigate this. And so we had someone send in information for a Bradford County region um, project, and that is called Delivered Fresh. Their website is deliveredfresh.localfoodmarketplace.com. Uh, and we got a lot of feedback that uh, the family organizing this has been doing a really amazing job uh, over the last six weeks during this crisis. So we love to hear about uh, how folks are answering these really important questions that are being posited during this time. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. We are going to move on to some questions. There were some questions submitted prior to the webinar today that do not pertain to today's webinar topic. So those will either be answered last or we'll get back to you um, through other channels. So the first question is, I'm very interested in rules of thumb for the kinds of costs one should expect with different methods of distribution. And if you can pass some of that along on to the customer. Is that I can actually, um, this is Sabina. Um, so um, for our center markets, what we've actually done um, we didn't do it the first couple of weeks, but the last two weeks we did experiment with adding uh, a shopper um, a handling fee. So we've been charging three dollars and eighty five cents per order just as a pack as a handling fee to cover some of our labor and overhead expenses. Okay, thank you. And we may adjust that in the future, but I think that's it's, it's really helped us get it off the ground. Thanks, Sabina. Did I hear Jacqueline too also? Yeah, I was wondering, um, Ms. Jacqueline, if the question was about the different points of distribution between national versus your own warehouse. And um, I'm, I'm assuming that's what he, maybe that had a little bit to do with it. But um, yeah, the, we have found that going through national distribution is about 16% it would cut, it'd be about 16% of your costs. And that actually um, hopefully does get passed down to the consumer. But when you're doing your margins, you got to make sure to always put that about 16 to 20 actually percent in your pricing when it goes to distribution. And distributors will take another 25, 20 to 25%. And depending on what segment of the grocery store you're in. And then the, um, Last of it is about whatever your margin is. But um, we found that doing our own distribution, it's probably around 13%. So we saved a couple points by bringing it in house. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, sources for cardboard bushel boxes to pack CSA shares. I would say start with Uline with that one. And then there might be like a local um, box company in your area that might have some custom made box options or options or stock box stock box options, but you can do some experimenting with Uline and actually get samples from them. So even if you don't end up purchasing a lot from Uline, you can at least experiment with what kind of sizes you need. I think I can piggyback on that as well. This is Neil. Um, yeah, Jacqueline, I think you're right. If you want to experiment, Uline's a good way, but like you said, with other things, they're not going to be cost competitive once you're ready to get some bulk. Uh, and once you're ready to get like a pallet or more, um, Monty packaging out of Michigan is a good source uh, that I've found, at least here from our region, that seemed to be about um, the best pricing. They also have like a green coat option, which uh, does not wax and therefore can be recycled. Um, so that would be a place I would check out. But then like I, I we're talking about earlier, if you can get a local cardboard supply company, if, you're, if you don't need it to be a produce box, you can make either a custom cut box or even just some of their off the line um, standard sized boxes a lot cheaper than a produce box too. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if all produce and baked goods are bagged or packaged, can customers still pick up their own selection from a table if they commit to purchasing? Yes, uh, this is permissible. It's just that we're really encouraging wherever possible to uh, pre-order and pre-pack. And please do put a sign out at the market saying, please do not touch anything unless you intend to purchase it. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna move to a couple questions that were submitted today. Um, question for Sabina. Oh, you've already answered this. What ordering platform do you use local line? Um, a lot of these questions are not necessarily to do with today's topic. So let me see, I'm just weeding through here. Um, Okay, we got a lot of questions that must have been submitted ahead of time that have to do with the PPP and EIDL loan. So we will answer those after today's call. Um, we did get a question. I am in a position uh, working for state and national conservation districts and farmers, and I want to better understand the situation to be able to communicate issues to legislators who often have limited understanding of our current dilemmas on the ground. Do you have ideas of how best to gather information about how your farmers and customers are experiencing the current situation for better advocacy? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, Anna, I'll just um, uh, put a plug in here for National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. They um, have, um, this is specific to farmers, of course, taking action and reaching out. Um, so we put a link up on there. Um, but I would say if you have farmers in your, in your members, you know, in your region, um, call them or text them and talk to them and ask them how they're doing and, and how they're experiencing it. Um, we at PASA have been calling a lot of our membership. Obviously, we can't call all of you, but um, it's been really helpful and informing. In fact, it's how we decide which webinars we're going to do each week, which forum topics, um, because you all are telling us the questions that you have for us. Um, so I'll turn it over to any of the other panelists on the call. But. Um, besides that, uh, the National Sustainable Ag Coalition, there's also your local like Farmers Union, um, those organizations as well, um, Farm Bureau, that can um, probably put you in touch with some other resources as well or give you an idea of what their, their um, regional folks are, are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. If would each of you be willing to just talk about one thing you've learned from this experience that you know will forever change the way uh, you handle 
aggregation and distribution and in any way do you see that actually benefiting the food system? Maybe all three of you could answer that. We could start with Jacqueline since she went first. And that's a very hard question to answer actually because we're so much in the thick of like this big learning curve and trying to kind of figure out how to as a whole in industry to step up into this place that we need to step up into. And um, I think that the thing that I'm taking away is just trying to figure out how to predict and project volumes of inventory and without understanding really what this new market is. Um, I don't know what I've learned about that yet. <laughs> I'm still very much trying to figure that out. So um, yeah, I, I'm sorry I can't answer that question very well. Okay. I guess I'm next. This is Neil. I, I, I kind of feel the same as Jacqueline. I, I wish I had some nugget for you. I'm not sure that I do. I mean, yeah, I, I guess just to be pre prepared for the unpredictable to some extent is, is kind of the generalized takeaway. Uh, like I said, you know, and just felt so differently about what this supply and demand was going to look like in December um, than, than we do now. And just trying to start to think ahead about what the new normal will look like and how to be prepared for, for that and not to um, presume that the way things are now will, will remain the same either. So um, just reminding ourselves to kind of think open-mindedly, creatively, and uh, be, be thinking ahead as much as possible and, and um, almost assuming that change is coming. It's just a matter of what it's going to look like. Um, this is Sabina. Um, I think the, the main thing I learned is that, um, you know, in some ways it just pays to be really small and nimble and be able to, to pivot, which is what a lot of our producers are doing. Um, and I think all the systems that we're setting in place now will really serve us down the road um, because some things are not ever going to be the way they were last year. And just having these collaborative efforts where people are working together, I think those can only serve us more and more um, in the future. And having more of that lo local control of, um, of our food system. Great, thank you. That's thank it. you. Uh, Neil, what category of groceries other than farm crops do you have in your product list? Well, it's almost exclusively farm crops if you want to, or farm products in one way or the other, if you want to think of it that way. Um, you know, the exception maybe being uh, bread that's made with local grains uh, in, a, in a bakery. But other than that, everything on the list, well, I guess we also do a locally roasted coffee. Um, but other than those things, it's all things that, you know, were derived from the farm. Um, veggies, apples, cider, honey, maple, eggs, cheese, uh, dried tea from an herb farm. Um, organic grains like oats and flour, cornmeal, sauerkraut, salsa. Uh, we did seedlings uh, this past week and then of course meat boxes as well. Okay, we have another question for you, Neil. What types of courier or delivery services have you used? I would like to determine if they're available in rural areas as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Obviously, I haven't researched that specifically, but I started out with zero knowledge about them and, and literally just a Google search uh, to, to see what was available in our region. Um, and, and I presume that that's, um, you know, how anyone could start is just a little bit of online research. Uh, we found that there's a pretty wide range. There's some that are national networks that, you know, could do uh, pretty broad geographies. The one we settled on was a, was a locally based company um, but it was big enough that we felt could scale uh, to the scale that we are hoping for. Then there also was some smaller ones that are almost like um, really software based that allowed almost like an Uber for taking groceries uh, to people's houses where they could pull from their network of gig, gig drivers and uh, have a hatchback pull up and, and load up six boxes and then take them where they need to go. Um, so it seemed like there's kind of a, a diversity of scales um, but I think just some online research would, would probably be the best resource. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sabina, if you were not handling all the inventory from multiple farms and they each had their own accounts on a shared marketplace, 
would the customers have to check out separately with each individual farm when they finish adding to their cart? No, um, if you, if we, if, if vendors had their own accounts and center markets had like the, the next level up, uh, it would still be uh, the same shopping experience for the shopper. They wouldn't realize that they were in different local line accounts. They would, they would, um, it would be one checkout experience, one shopping basket. Um, so I always look at it like the, the, the next level tier up with local line, which is the one we don't have right yet. That is like the big farmer's market. And then all the different vendor accounts, those are just the tables at the, at the farmer's market. And you would just go around and get your goodies and then check out on your way out the door. Um, so um, that's our goal is to is to go for that model because I think the administrative um, overhead and um, time will be a lot uh, more manageable, but we're not there yet. Okay. Um, one person's asking, Sabina, will you be putting gift certificates as just one of the products that you offer for sale? I think that's the way a lot of people are handling these online um, e-commerce sites is they actually just create an item called gift certificates that people can buy. Um, yes, that way they could buy them, but I would like them to be able to use, um, like then they would just get a gift certificate. I want that to be some sort of a credit that can then be applied mm -hmm. by somebody else. Does local, li does local line have a gift certificate function that essentially would draw down the balance for the purchaser? That, that's what I'm, I, I don't know. I'm, okay. okay. I, I would like to find out and ask them to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, another question for Sabina, how many people are putting together the orders in the church? How many orders come through in a day and how long does it take once they're in the church to be fulfilled? Um, so um, our, our growth has been pretty exponential. So every week we get a lot more orders than the week before. Um, up till about two weeks ago, I was able just to do it by myself pretty quickly. Um, and then um, on Tuesday, we had, um, there was two of us, and it took about an hour and a half to put the boxes together. So um, it, it takes some time, and I think just planning ahead and finding out, you know, I, I, it was really helpful for us to have space away from the market, like inside the church where shoppers could come up to us and say, oh, I'm going to buy this, I want to get that. You know, it's like <laughs> um, they, um, we, were, we were able to focus on our work. Um, so I think it is helpful to have an area that's set aside away from the public. Um, so those can just be filled. And then, of course, it's hard like, to figure out a system where two or more people can work together filling boxes while still maintaining um, social distancing. Um, and, you know, sanitation procedures. So um, we're going to be spending a lot of time. I, I'm, I'm, I'm having two more volunteers next week to help fill boxes. So with four people working on it, we really need to come up with like a, a map on where people are located and where they can reach. Um, so yeah, it takes some, it takes some enabling to, to do it. Okay. Hannah, I can chime in on yes. that too if you want. Yep. Uh, this yep. is kind of a similar function that we're providing, uh, filling, filling these uh, customized orders, um, essentially having staff members that are, are doing um, uh, what Center County is doing with, with just filling these customized orders as a grocery shopping almost um, assembly line. But uh, we roughly, we're doing a couple hundred boxes in a day and figuring it, including setting up the table, getting all the products organized, you know, all the um, sanitation processes the whole way through palletizing them and getting them ready to go to the outward to the couriers. Um, the whole process itself works out to about 10 minutes per order so far. Not that we can't hopefully get uh, better at that, but that was like a rough guideline if you're just thinking about uh, how many you could do in a day or whatever. We, we have, um, I think we had six or seven staff members and, uh, you know, worked out to about 10 minutes in order. 
Okay, great, thanks. Um, we have a question. Are there tools that any of you would recommend that would help farmers create, monitor, and manage cooperative marketing? And we also have Brian Moyer um, from PA Farm Markets and uh, Penn State Extension on the call. So I think we'll promote you to panelists, Brian, if you have anything that you would like to answer in terms of that question, then we'll move to the other panelists. Forgive me, I drifted. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing like putting you on the spot. Sorry, I thought no, you no, right. knew I was going to call on you. Um, are there tools that any of you would recommend that would help farmers create, monitor, and manage cooperative marketing? Um, yeah, there's a there's a document I refer to a lot, and maybe I can try quickly find the link and put it in the Q and A. It's from um, Cornell. And uh, actually, if you just Google it, it comes up. It's it is um, um, cooperative or collective marketing, not cooperative. Collective marketing for small farms is the name of the the document, and it highlights about um, a couple, a number of different ways that farms can work collectively without actually formally collect uh, creating a cooperative. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with a cooperative, but maybe to start out, especially in times like this where we're all trying to move very quickly that we can do something together that does more than we could do individually, like um, uh, um, collective marketing agreements um, and then some things like that are all highlighted in that document. So uh, I highly recommend that uh, collective collaborative marketing for small farms. Okay. And there's a Thank worksheet you. in the back of it that actually ha takes you through the process of the things you should think about. So everybody's on the same page and what everybody's, but we're clear exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm aware that we have about three minutes. Uh, we're happy to go over by a couple minutes. Also, we can uh, send out answers to these questions after the webinar. All the information from the webinar uh, will be shared afterward. Jacqueline, do you have a dedicated employee to handle order processing, packing, and shipping? And if so, how many hours do they spend on this? Yeah, we, um, we do have a small, um, we have a, some employees that are dedicated to the handling and processing and packaging and shipping. Um, and it's a, actually a full-time, well, it's moving quickly into full-time because we also do fulfillment for other companies too. So it's, that's all that they do is come here and they do processing, packaging, and shipping for us. So full-time work. <laughs> Uh, we had a question. Um, someone was looking for a volunteer coordinator. Where are they located? I think, Sabina, that might have been you in Center County in Pennsylvania. Is that accurate? Perhaps the listener. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking while muted. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yes, that was me in Center County, but I've, I've already hired a volunteer coordinator. Okay. All right, great. All right, uh, Sabina and others, are there any provisions for EBT acceptance? We have heard that some markets are doing workarounds for that. And I don't know, Brian, maybe you have something to add to that as well. We did a, um, on our, um, I've been hosting a weekly farmers market manager forum. And uh, that was our topic actually yesterday. And um, the Food Trust uh, out of Philadelphia and had um, talked about what they were, they are doing with their markets. And actually, they have a um, a uh, paper receipt that the vendors have. And um, the person who wants to use uh, EBT, uh, they select what they want. The vendor writes down how much it is and um, gives that to the food trust table manages is managing the snap for market and then um, they redeem those benefits from that person and the person can get their uh, what they picked out at the at that vendor um, you can order ebt folks can order online they just can't pay online if you do an advanced order so but they can pay when they come to pick up their order Okay, um, any other panelists have any anything having to do with EBT to offer? 
Um, as much as we would like to be able to offer it, I think not being able to accept uh, EBT payments online, I, you know, I think that's something that, you know, the, the state government needs, you know, I think that's what they're working on is, mm -hmm. is, is, make, is changing that system. I think it's just a security um, concern at this point. Um, yeah, I can, but I know, I know, it's, I think Brian can speak to that further too. But yes, as soon as it's available to take online EBT payments, we will be thrilled to do so. Yeah, you're, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Sabine. We had um, uh, Just Harvest also was on our, our forum yesterday and had pointed out that uh, I, guess, um, I guess it's DHS, the Department of Health Services, is, uh, is trying to get Pennsylvania to be one of the pilot states. And actually, large retailers are the ones that are driving this because even though they who operate in multiple states, somebody like Walmart, uh, and they can take EBT, but they can't in Pennsylvania. So you imagine they're also driving that conversation as well, too. Great. Okay. Um, I think we have here just one more question, and then we will tie up the webinar. Um, and that is if folks have uh, any uh, warnings or encouragements around uh, payment exchange apps like Venmo and PayPal. This is Jacqueline and I use uh, PayPal quite frequently for orders uh, like local direct to consumer orders. I've never had an issue with it whatsoever. It's worked really well for us. Great. Well, thank you so much to all of our uh, presenters today. Uh, we've really enjoyed the time together. Um, please remember that we are uh, holding these webinars once a week on Thursdays. Uh, the reason why your screen has gone blank in terms of seeing a presentation is uh, Christina, who was running the presentation, has just let me know her power has gone out due to a storm. So. Um, all the resources for all these webinars are at pasafarming.org uh, forward slash COVID-19 or resources and uh, look for the topic each week and please do submit questions ahead of time. Unless something major comes down the road having to do with COVID-19, we are actually planning on organizing more of an open forum uh, for next Thursday's webinar. So we'll start with a quick update, but then allow more, uh, and we'll probably have a variety of uh, panelists on the webinar and uh, may even break into small group uh, sessions for small group discussion. So uh, thank you everyone for joining the, the webinar today. Have a great day and we will uh, see it on, see you all on Thursday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hannah.